Good afternoon. Welcome to our second Monday Monologues event this spring. I'm Susan Gent, and I work at both the Iowa State and Ames Public Libraries. I hope you all visit the University Library YouTube channel and like the, the page and, and follow it so you can hear about all sorts of different uh, programs and resources that the library makes available. Today, I am so excited to introduce you all to Jennifer Knox, who teaches at the Iowa State University English Department. She co-owns Salt Liquors, an artisanal herb and spice infused seasoning blend company. And as you will hear shortly, she writes imaginative poetry. Jennifer received her BA from the University of Iowa and her MFA in creative writing and poetry from New York University. At her university contact page, Jennifer states that the goal of all writing is to connect with readers. After you listen to Jennifer's reading today, you'll have experienced that connection. You'll feel how she connects the dots with a wit warped by wacky life experiences, obscured television and movie references, and dark humor, Jennifer's poetry takes me on a joy ride every time I hear her read, and I can't wait to go back for more. Jennifer's fifth book, Crushing It, was published last October by Copper Canyon Press. The New York Times said, quote, Knox's poetry is massively entertaining, but it's an entertainment of substance, end quote. Since Jennifer is a grown up, today's performance may contain adult language and themes. I want to thank you all for being here and to welcome Jennifer Knox. Hi, Susan. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. I am so happy to hear you read today, and I've been looking forward to this for a long time. So well, that, that was lovely and very astute because the first poem I'm going to read today contains adult language. So that was very savvy. You really knew, you really knew your speaker. Um, hi, everybody. Thanks so much for coming. I'm honored to read for the Monday Monologue series. And the first poem I'm going to read is about a Russian sage bush that we have had in our driveway for a long time. And let I'm anxious to see this year if the derecho wiped it out because it looked wiped out afterwards, but uh, I'm not sure. So this is a, a poem to the sage bush and it does contain a profane word in it. It's called the passion of the pollinators. The Russian sage bush in the driveway has gone berserko shooting shoots like fireworks, some 10 feet long in all directions. Oh, and the whole thing smells like B.O. Go figure, Flora rivaling Disney's fruitiest princess reeks like teenage pits. Green, gray, frilly stalks droop under all the bewitched bumblebees rocking their pollen-packed purple flower clusters stems sway back beneath their unbuckable buzz. The bees have dumped a thick carpet of petals onto the concrete in the same shape as the bushes undulating shadow, a purple shadow peppered with a few dead bees. The shadows like a portrait the bees have painted of their love, a painting worth dying for titled this shit right here. When I walk by, they follow close as if to say, keep walking, bozo. After dark, they're like sleeping sheep in it. My headlights glint off their black, unblinking eyes. And uh, this poem is about having a dog put down and um, that's why I didn't open with it. You can't open with a poem about that, but um, this is uh, about our dog, Abby, and it's called Abby the Comedian. And it mentions Dr. Merle, who is the vet in Nevada where I live, as well as my uh, in-laws, Debbie and Denny. Abby the Comedian. I'm surprised how long it takes her heart to stop strong old girl. 
Dr. Merle keeps the stethoscope pressed to her ribs. I lean down in front of her unblinking eyes and assure her, you're a good dog, Abby. Deb, Denny, and Dr. Merle agree. You are a good dog, Abby. A beat or two, Dr. Merle puts the stethoscope away. There are faint gray spots on her rump I've never noticed. Did they swim up when she got sick? No, I remember hearing color in the fur begins in the skin. Denny coughs. <laughs> this is the saddest one. She had a hard life. Found love in the end though, Dr. Merle says, looking down, petting her, and it's true. If Abby's life had been a Greek play, technically, it would have been a comedy. But how does Dr. Merle know that? Can he feel it through her still warm hide, shooting off hairs with each pass? Denny scoops her up and carries her to the truck. Her stuck out white paw bounces with each step. Bye bye, bye bye, bye bye. Back at the house, we wait for Colin to help Denny dig the hole. Dr. Merle seems like a nice guy. I say to Denny, and I think to let me know Dr. Merle wasn't blowing smoke, or maybe to make me feel better, Denny says, Dr. Merle knew everything about her. This poem is, it has a Irwin Allen in the title, Irwin Allen if you're unfamiliar, uh, he was, they, I think they called him the master of disaster. He made all those big disaster films in the late 60s and 70s, like the Poseidon Adventure and the Towering Inferno and Airport. I think the equivalent would be the, today would be the series of uh, disaster films that The Rock has done if The Rock were directing them. But now, usually if we see The Rock, we know that um, buildings are going to fall and he's going to have to save the day. And um, also uh, the poems about uh, a lion tamer and this wonderful documentary, my favorite documentary, Fast, Cheap and Out of Control, who said that he became a lion tamer because he loved Clyde Beatty, who was a lion tamer in the 30s and 40s in movies. And he said, back then, we didn't know who would win in a battle of man versus nature. So Irwin Allen and the Lion Tamer came together to help me write this poem. It's called Irwin Allen versus the Lion Tamer. We used to love Lion Tamers because people really didn't know who would win in a battle of man versus nature. Back then, all the stories ended in death, our death, by mauling or snake bite or dog bite or being struck by lightning, smothered by an avalanche, charged off a cliff, carried away in the talons of an eagle, inhaled by a whale, stung by a scorpion, swarmed by killer bees, gored by a rhino, poisoned by berries, pricked by a sticker, swallowed by quicksand, beguiled by a black cat, gobbled up by a witch. So imagine the relief with one flick of the whip and an up, the skulking lion stands on legs like a human. It's toothy protest, no big thing. After all those years of fear, I'd laugh at it too. And that's what people did until there were no more lions to laugh at. But Irwin Allen knew death doesn't live in a thing you can kill with a gun. It's not the heat, it's the hubris. The fire that wipes the city out begins in birthday candles and the happy huff behind them. The storm that flips the cruise ship starts in the sea that rises up to fill the empty sky. An airplane crash begins not in birds, but in feeders we've stolen the seed from. Certain nobody can see us. And this poem is called Full House, right after the show. And um, mushrooms make an appearance in this poem. And uh, I'm a big fan of 
mushrooms. Full House. We'll never know the Tanners any better than we do after the show's 42 second intro. When the girls come dancing over a green San Francisco hill, laughing at a joke we missed. A happy man strums a guitar, but we can't hear his song because the intro's drowning him out. Maybe he's just moving his lips. Another man touches his car, stares at the camera, and smiles. That's all there is to know, which means we know the Tanners better than the real people we love, who are silently jettisoning thoughts and parts of themselves that no longer benefit them as a snake sheds dead skin. Sometimes that skin is us and they don't know they're changing, but we do far before we're sloughed off in the grass. The tanners are like mushrooms born with every cell they need. No matter how much it rains, they'll soak it up. Only the singers of their theme song will ever change size. Uh, okay. One of my little sticky notes fell away. Oop, here it is. Uh, so in my new book, um, there are lots of poems about diseases that were written before COVID. And it was because I was inspired by a podcast called This Podcast Will Kill You, where the two Aaron's uh, are both doctorates in uh, diseases. They're disease doctorates. And uh, they just blew my mind. I spend a lot of time uh, listening to podcasts. And when I found them, I was just delighted. And this one is inspired by a podcast they did. This poem's called Guinea Pigs. Guinea pigs are Andean rodents that were originally domesticated for food, then imported to Europe as pets for rich people. Queen Elizabeth I had a pet guinea pig. The oldest guinea pig skeleton in England dates back to 1540. Imagine guinea pigs traveling all that way by boat, which were back then dark and riddled with rot, stench, rats, and scurvy, king killer of nutritional deficiencies, which outkilled other nutritional deficiencies by attacking the one thing connecting everything in our bodies, collagen, a Greek word derived from the practice of boiling down horse parts for glue. Guinea pigs were eventually used as guinea pigs in early experiments on scurvy, which moved through them and broke them down much in the same way it did us. It was about time. The rats we'd been using in the labs, something about their fleas, which seemingly knew no bounds had started to give us the willies. And I'm gonna read two more. This is a poem for my Aunt Marilyn. And I know that you're, you all are out there watching this on an internet screen and we have the chat room to talk and uh, that, doesn't sound like much fun, but I guarantee you if my Aunt Marilyn was here and, and still with us and somehow in this reading, we'd all be having a 100% better time. And there's a few uh, adult words in this poem too, which is just the way she would like it, would have liked it. It's called Marilyn Every Day We Wonder. Marilyn, Every day we wonder what you think about all this. I imagine you crashing through the inaugural barricades or flying a stolen helicopter into a wildfire with a margarita gripped between your knees. Remember that time gridlocked on the five? You winked at a bearded dude leaning on the asphalt roller. I'd only seen women wink at men in movies. He leered, I might get laid. And you drawled, why don't you get that piece of shit out of the road? Shock splashed across his face. Lock the doors. Crazy 
bitch, he roared and punched our hood. Clueless how close he was to getting his ass shot. We found the loaded gun under your mattress, Smith and Wesson, cowgirl style, swirly pearl handle, and the serial number filed off. We like to take it out at parties. What a cute gun. We also found several transistor radios and a box of old weed. Cheers, auntie. With one phone call, you scared my scary Brooklyn landlord into fixing my deadbolt. You were six states away and a 72 year old woman. There's a pack of kids down the street in a house that's falling apart. We never see an adult. No matter how cold or dark it is, they're always playing outside with a new puppy. We have no idea where the old puppies have gone, but if you were here, we know there'd be no more of this new puppy bullshit. Cheers, auntie. And this last poem I'm going to read is uh, a poem that honors the effigy mounds historic site, state historic site, uh, and was commissioned by the Poetry Society of America. Effigy Mounds National Monument, Iowa. Before there was the time we see, there was the time we saw through, when the biggest bear lay down, exhaled the boundary of herself, whew, and rolled onto her side. Her family followed in a line, bending like an oxbow lake, crocheting holes in the land where water bubbled through. So much does bubble through. Birds saw the bears bubbling up and dug it. Whoa! So with wing fingers wide, they pressed their feathered breasts flat to the ground, which sang their own song back at them, but way slower, like whale songs in amber. Is that a yes or a no? The birds asked. Yes, replied the ground. Whoa! Green grass grew over them, which was a long green love song. Nearby, turtles, panthers, dogs lost their boundaries, exhaled, then found them again and became constellations. What speed was the time signature singing when all those holes in space opened up and bear after bear, bird after bird, sun after sun, lost, refound their shapes in the long song, knowing themselves at last for what they really were, eternal, immutable from every possible angle. Thank you. This would be where we'd have applause if we were in real life, in real person. I, I hear them all the time. Oh, maybe that's tinnitus. I don't know. I was gonna say, whoa. Too. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Jennifer, I, I've i heard you read several of those poems several times and um, you really did teach me or, or maybe I just obsess about you a little bit because when I do read your work, I, I have your voice in my head. <laughs> you said, uh, you taught me something about my own work and it was when I first met you, you were lovely enough to go out and buy my book. So I said, okay, she's a keeper. You went out and bought my book and somebody asked me at a reading, do you write these poems for your own voice or do you write them for somebody else to hear their voice in it? And I said, well, I think that everybody's voice is in the, I can imagine it in the poem. And afterwards you told me, no, 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 no. I've read these on the page, but when I hear you read them, they just click together. So they do. they do. Yeah. I thought that was, I, that has really stuck with me. Well, and um, I must confess, I haven't heard many poets read, but um, you know, your, your voice and your style are, are so distinctly you. I think nice. that's, um, that's why I enjoy it so much. So um, I did put on the screen um, a link to your webpage where folks can learn more about you, um, mm -hmm. your background, look at um, your other titles, 
purchase a copy of Crushing It, uh, find out about salt liquors, other readings you're doing, and yes. uh, also see you have a blog. So I will be reading that and getting caught up. Um, we don't have any, we don't have any Q&A, huh? No, we don't. Okay. Um, since we're live streaming through YouTube, that is not an, an option. So. If uh, anybody has any questions for me, they can get in touch with me at knox at iastate.edu or jennifer l knox at gmail terrific um i would love to see what those responses are and and again that's one of those things that we're missing in this virtual world mm -hmm. um, hopefully some people who wouldn't have been able to be in ames for a live performance are able to join us it is cool yes well i am trying to share my screen i am um, we are gonna take a few weeks off before we come back on March 22nd. And uh, Iowa State University theater students will be sharing monologues that they're developing in response to um, uh, their play, Facing Our Truths. Uh, so those are student monologues on race and privilege. I think that'll be really interesting to hear that real personal impact of um, how they are experiencing the roles they're playing in this uh, Iowa State Theater production. Then on April 5th, we're actually going to be outside Parks Library and uh, some Iowa State University Music Department students will be performing. Uh, I love the title, My Soul is Awakened. I feel like on a sunny day like this, my soul is awakened. And um, so I hope folks can come and join us. Uh, the um, music department will be live streaming it themselves. Uh, the library won't. Then we'll be back on April 12th for First Amendment week and we'll be hearing uh, different voices speaking about the power of peaceful protest. And our last event of the year will only be live and um, that will be on the South Park's steps as well. And that is Songs for a New World, which is the ISU Theater's last performance of the season. So Jennifer, I wanna thank you so much. You were the, the first uh, poet who read for us uh, with Jake Dawson. And actually you weren't doing poetry so much for that presentation, but glad you I, came. I thought, I thought I was, but. Oh, okay, maybe you did. <laughs> no, I, it, was a, it was a long prose poem, so. Yes, okay, so yes. Weird and, animal. Yes, and you, you tested the waters and helped come up with the, the title Monday Monologues. And so I was- It's a great series. Especially pleased that you came back. Thank you so much for reading. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming. Yep. Okay. Bye. Bye.